Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Throughout the years of filming Wild Kingdom, we were faced with the grim reality of extinction of some animal species. In the early 60s and 70s, animals were negatively impacted by the loss of habitat and the use of a chemical insecticide known as DDT. Today, DDT has been banned in the United States, and we've made great strides to preserve wide open spaces where animals can thrive. Wild Kingdom made a direct impact on modern captive breeding and release programs, and we're now seeing a positive comeback from many species. We must all do our part to continue this progress to protect all animals in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, the largest carnivorous land animal in the world, a species presently threatened with extinction, is the polar bear. Its worldwide population is now only about 12,000, and this number is shrinking despite increased protection of the species. Yet, even though their numbers are low, a major problem in one small area of Manitoba, Canada, is their overabundance. Early in winter, great concentrations of polar bears gather here on the western shore of Hudson's Bay at a place called Cape Churchill. Our program today is a special report on the polar bears of Churchill. It begins nearly 200 miles south in this area and in the spring rather than winter. This is the Kaskatama Valley at the Manitoba-Ontario border in late March. A polar bear den stares like a dark eye from a snowdrift. Inside, it is roomy and bright, 40 degrees warmer than outside. Today, it is empty for the first time in four months. <laughs> Its four occupants, a mother and her triplets, have just abandoned the den permanently. Usually, the polar bears have two cubs, but on rare occasions, they will have three like these. When these young were first born in the den late last November, each was only 10 inches long and weighed a pound and a half. For a month, they were without sight or hearing but on the heavy, nutritious milk provided by their mother all winter long, they have developed rapidly. Another resident of the area wearing its winter white plumage is the willow ptarmigan. Though a vicious fighter and skilled hunter, the mother polar bear is a gentle and loving mother. Though well camouflaged now, she and the cubs will lose their stark whiteness during the summer and become yellowish or even golden colored until winter comes again. From their mother, these cubs will learn how to hunt on the ice pack when the bay freezes and how to run across the ice at 15 miles an hour or more without falling. By August, these cubs will weigh over 130 pounds each, but they will still be immature and considered to be sub-adults for three or four years.
When the cubs are full grown, the males will be enormous, 11 feet long, weighing perhaps as much as 1,600 pounds. The females rarely exceed 500 pounds. Well adapted to the cold climate, they acquire layers of fat as much as three inches thick. Their dense cottony fur not only keeps them warm, but also serves as camouflage, like the ptarmigan's winter white. As the many other polar bear cubs in this region are doing, they will now follow their mother toward the nearby Hudson Bay to learn important lessons in survival. Soon, it will be easier to live in this hostile terrain as spring arrives. The ptarmigan will begin nesting, and the winter snows will melt away under the warming sun. The bears will spend the entire summer and early fall hunting animals of various kinds and swimming in the waters of the bay in this area. Then, as the first snowfall of winter strikes, it triggers an instinctive migration of the bears, and they begin moving northward to Cape Churchill along this route. Here at the Cape is where the Great Bay freezes first, and where the bears gather to eventually disperse on the ice to hunt seals. Recently, Tom Allen and I went to the town of Churchill to observe these bears and see the serious problem their migration creates. Unfortunately, the bay is usually still open water when the bears arrive, and so they must wait for the freeze. Food for them is scarce, and they begin to forage in the town dump and prowl in the streets of Churchill. They become dangerous to the people living in the town and frequently must be driven off by a bear patrol. There has been serious talk of killing these bears to end the problem, but no one wants to destroy such magnificent endangered animals needlessly. So to better understand the jeopardy facing these great bears, we flew northward along their migration route to Cape Churchill. As we fly northward along the migrational route, the stark hostility of this landscape is apparent. Inland, a short distance from the bay, this is a land of muskeg, frozen or partially frozen marshy lakes of all sizes. No trees are visible, and the air is clear and cold. We will decrease airspeed and lower altitude now to look for some bears. Though what we're seeing below gives the impression of lifelessness, it's an illusion we soon see what was hidden from higher up, the polar bear. This big male is on a mantle of snow and ice not yet thick enough to properly support him, despite his broad, heavily furred feet. At this rate, he might be a little late arriving in Churchill. It takes a lot of food to sustain a thousand pound bear. And when scores of them converge in one area, survival becomes a major problem. That's why, until the bay freezes over, the bears forage so much at the Churchill town dump. With these shallows of the bay as yet unfrozen, it will undoubtedly still be a good while before the principal ice pack forms at Cape Churchill. We're moving in closer to the bears now, and there's one who doesn't like us this near. They're tremendously powerful swimmers with lots of endurance. Those big oar-like feet thrust him along at six miles an hour. If he wanted to, he could dive and stay under for two minutes. We're approaching Churchill now, and we'll soon be landing. The second part of our special report on the polar bears of Churchill deals with the problems the bears are causing in the Churchill area. The area around Churchill, where we are landing, is no less hostile than the area over which we have flown already. Churchill is a grain shipping port with a population of 1,200. 
And they are the people who are being jeopardized by the presence of the congregating polar bears. Human safety is of paramount concern, of course, but the work being done by such men as Brian Davies and Dale Cross, who greet us, is also important. Their concern is saving polar bears. Brian Davies heads the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and Dale Cross is a Manitoba wildlife technician. It's the organization headed by Brian that is financing the relocation of some of the endangered bears, which congregate here along a backwater of the bay. The first bears we see are a couple of sub-adults who still retain some of their cub-like playfulness. These bears are probably two and a half years old. They look thoroughly harmless, but even a young bear like one of these can be dangerous if threatened or teased. About 200 polar bears gather at Cape Churchill each year awaiting the freeze. As Brian explains it, that's part of the problem. Some of the older bears are short-tempered. Waiting for the bay to freeze wears patients thin. Many residents of Churchill come to the edge of town here to watch the bears, take their pictures, and unfortunately, sometimes to tease them. When they do, there's the ever-present danger of attack, and this is amplified when the bears occasionally stroll through town. As we can see, most of the young bears spend the days and weeks of waiting, roaming about or playing with one another. For the most part, they're not aggressive toward humans who keep a respectful distance and don't bother them. These more playful bears which stay near the bay are not the ones in danger of being destroyed. It is the bears which leave this bay area and frequent the town dump that most often cause troubles. If such bears are not quickly immobilized and removed to some distant area away from human contact, then government rangers will be forced to shoot them. It is this program of immobilization and removal underway right now in which Brian Davies and others are engaged. It is not here by the bay where the worst incidents have occurred. Those take place in the area we're now heading for, the town dump. This is the danger spot. The bears that come here are hungry, and a hungry bear is not noted for his good humor. In the mounds of trash, garbage, and other debris, the bears become very dirty as they forage for food, and they don't like interference. Mother bears and their cubs often forage here too, and the females, as we can see right now, become very aggressive in the protection of their young. When I asked what kind of food the bears were seeking here, Brian said they would eat almost anything. In fact, polar bears, since they are never exposed to fire, seem to have no fear of it, especially if there is a possibility of food close to the flames. Often they will spend hours near fires like this, eating tidbits of garbage. When they've had their fill, some of these big animals leave the dump and wander aimlessly through town. The citizens are justifiably upset. Brian Davies says much of the problem could be eliminated by building an incinerator or relocating the dump. But necessary funds have been unavailable for such projects. Of course, as soon as the bay freezes, the problem will end for another year. Until then, the bears must simply wait. The main object in the minds of the conservationists involved with the bear program is to prevent needless slaughter of the big animals whose instincts have driven them here. 
These hungry bears are potentially dangerous and must be trapped and relocated. There is no better area in which to trap them than on the other side of the dump, where earlier Tom Allen went with Dale Cross when they left us. We've been checking the snares ever since leaving Marlin and Brian. And now Dale's preparing to immobilize one of the bears that has been caught. I've seen the fast-acting drug Sucostrin used in hypodermic darts before, but never on polar bears. Dale tells me that it is quite effective and has proven most valuable in the bear removal program. Dale and his fellow wildlife technicians like Brian Woten use this wheeled culvert for relocating bears, like the one we're about to immobilize. The number on this trapped bear indicates he was caught and marked once before. This time, he'll be relocated. The hypo dart is propelled by a powder charge in a specially prepared 22 caliber shell, allowing optimum injection impact without injuring the bear. These dump bears are trapped by using a simple cable snare placed where the bear will step. It closes around the ankle and holds the bear firmly, but without the foot damage a steel trap inflicts. The Sucostrin injection will act most rapidly if Dale can place his dart in the neck. It's a good hit. Though he's gotten to his feet, he won't be standing for very long. The drug was injected as soon as the dart struck, and even though the animal can sometimes shake it loose, it's too late to prevent the drug from acting. It's taking effect now. A short while more, and he'll be down and out. Time to get the transportation culvert ready so he can be loaded and taken to the airport for far distant release. The drug's effect lasts long enough for us to get him loaded in safety. Soon, he'll be released unharmed, where he can hurt no one, and where no one will harm him. Now, the third portion of our special report concerns the relocation of the bears. The bear is very limp, and we're thankful he's only half grown and not one of the enormous adult males. He's been measured and remarked in the previous tagging data recorded. This whole culvert trap will be flown south. Next time it's opened in a few hours, the bear will be free again. While Tom and the others are busy with their bear, I'll head south in this helicopter to the area where other bears are being released. I'm flying with one of the world's leading authorities on polar bears, Dr. Charles Jonkel, research scientist with the Canadian Wildlife Service. He's the man most responsible for this bear program. Our plan is to move along rapidly for about 100 miles south. Then we'll lower altitude in order to observe some northward migrating bears more closely. Dr. Jonkel is interested in seeing if any of them will be animals he's marked. The miles pass quickly. There's a mother and two cubs, but she has no black number painted on her rump. We'll continue toward the release site, which isn't too far ahead of us now. We could easily have missed seeing this bear running through the brushy cover. He's heading toward Cape Churchill, but has over a hundred miles to go. At normal walking speed, it will take him another three or four days to get there. 
The sure-footedness with which these animals can travel across broken icy surfaces is incredible. That animal below is probably about 10 years old, with another quarter century to live, provided he doesn't run into difficulties at the Churchill dump. There's another unmarked female with cubs. time for a quick look at a final pair of migrating bears before we have to land only a few miles ahead. Since none of these bears we've seen moving toward Cape Churchill were previously marked, there's a good possibility that these bears being relocated are moving directly to the shore of Hudson Bay and waiting there for the free. We've arrived at the airstrip here, 180 miles south of Churchill, just in time. They are releasing a bear that was caught at the dump several hours before Tom and Dale got theirs. He seems a bit confused by his surroundings, but he'll soon get his bearings. Firecrackers are used to urge him away from the landing strip area. Mm. Mm -hmm. He's moving off well enough now and will probably keep on going. For the 24th time this season, concerned conservationists have preserved another magnificent polar bear of Churchill. The significance of the work currently being done on polar bears, both in research and preservation, cannot be overstated. Through the efforts of highly dedicated men like Dr. Charles Junkel, the successful immobilization of polar bears with drugs, recording data about them, and then moving them a safe distance from Churchill is doubly beneficial. First, it averts the actual destruction of these magnificent bears government officials will be forced to kill them if they are not moved. Secondly, it provides much new material about the bears themselves, their habits, movements, and vital statistics, which will continue to be important in further research work on the species. It also points out the need to keep from acting in haste where destruction of wild animals is concerned. Farsighted cooperation is occurring between scientists, game management personnel, local citizens, private conservation organizations, and the Canadian government. As a result, the polar bear is being given a chance to retain its rightful place in the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.